الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه والولاه All grace is due to Allah, the sole creator, sustainer and cherisher of the universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his last messenger Muhammad and upon all prophets and messengers who preceded him My brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of all of the prophets in its final and most beautiful and complete form Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means may the peace, blessing, and mercy of Allah be with you. <coughs> Excuse me. As members of one of the one and only human family, we all share a planet which is growing smaller and more interdependent economically, ecologically, politically, and otherwise. That makes it quite necessary to promote mutual understanding amongst us. And this becomes more significant when we realize that we are a part of a human generation that was able to leap on the moon, yet it is still limping, crawling right here on Earth. It is crawling economically in view of the widespread poverty and deprivation even in the midst of affluence. Exploitation and greed within nations and globally does exist. It is crawling politically as the majority of mankind is living under undemocratic totalitarian systems of government which disregard their political, economic, even human rights. Even in democratic societies, the disproportionate power uh, held by some interest groups stand in the way of real sharing of power and human and uh, economic resources. In some cases, minorities also are treated unfairly and being blamed for anything wrong that goes on in society. The world is crawling morally, socially, and spiritually, as evidenced by racism, narrow nationalism, ethnocentrism, and above all, spiritual vacuum. The absence of real peace and justice on the individual and collective levels. As a result, we see a decline in adherence to the lofty and universal moral standards, disintegration of the family and hence of society, the spread of drug and alcohol abuse, and the spread of violence and terrorism on the levels of individuals, groups, and states, both imported and homegrown. Promotion of mutual understanding can contribute to the diffusion of existing tensions and bring better reconciliation. One of those means, actually, is interfaith relations. No matter how much secularized and materialized is our world today, Faith still plays a pivotal role in shaping people's attitudes and perspectives of life. In the interfaith field, Islam occupies a very important role, being at least the professed faith of one out of every five human beings, nearly 1.2 billion. But for any serious and sincere interfaith or intellectual dialogue to succeed, the proper methodology should be observed. There are at least four guidelines. First, <coughs> to approach this dialogue with a positive attitude, rather than the spirit of antagonism, haughtiness, and confrontation, which is often bred by media stereotypes and historical legacies and baggages. Secondly, to make a distinction between the normative and authentic teaching of any faith and the actions of some of its professed followers contrary to those teachings. Certainly, Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, should not be blamed for the Crusades, the religious wars in Europe or in Northern Ireland, the Inquisition or crime in the street, or what happened to Muslims in Chechnya and Bosnia. Nor should Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, be blamed for any acts of terrorism such as blowing up public places or any other random violence against peaceful civilians. 
nor should Moses be blamed for either the assassination of Rabin or the inhuman treatment of the Palestinian people under occupation. It is not Christianity, true Christianity, Islam, or Judaism that should be blamed for this, but those who pay lip service to what they claim to believe in. A third guideline is to pay attention to the key religious terms and their linguistic origin. For in the media, there are many serious mistranslations, especially of Islamic terminology, that gives it sometimes the opposite meaning. And finally, <coughs> when we try to understand any world faith, an important major world faith like Islam, Christianity, or Judaism for that matter, one has to try to understand it in its own perspective rather than imposing an alien framework on it. But how may Islam contribute to this dearly needed dialogue? To answer that question, a basic knowledge of the nature of Islam and its message is a must. Perhaps one can start off by the, <coughs> excuse me, the proper definition of the very term Islam itself, a term that is not derived from the name of any person, group, or location, but is an attributive title coming from the Arabic root SLM, as it sounds in English, which actually means peace, commitment, and submission. Actually properly defined, Islam means to achieve peace through submission to God, to Allah, the creator of all. Peace with God, within oneself, and if a person really is true to his or her faith, it would inevitably result in peace with the creation of God, human, animal, uh, inanimate objects even in the universe. And by submission here is meant willing, conscious, loving submission to God and trusting in the validity of his teaching and his guidance. In other words, the ultimate objective of normative or true Islam is to achieve complete harmony between the human and the creator on one hand and between the human and the creation of the creator, on the other hand. That essence has been described in the Quran, the revealed holy book of Islam. In summing up the mission of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we find something from which the title of this presentation has been derived. It says, we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as mercy to the worlds, not only humanity, to the worlds in plural. This evening, inshallah, we'll try to examine <coughs> four basic reasons why Islam is mercy not only to humanity, but to the worlds. And these are its divine origin, secondly, universality, thirdly, its comprehensive and balanced nature, and fourthly, its contribution even to material human progress and civilization. Let's take each separately. It's a divine origin. Perhaps a simple illustration might indicate why Islam is mercy to mankind. For one of the basic reasons of confusion of the human race today and the conflict that arise from time to time is that as humans, we became separate from God. It is that separateness from God and taking other gods, whether it's materialism, uh, nationalism or any other ism that is at the cause, at the root of the problems we're facing today. Now, when we buy a, a new piece of equipment, like a car, we get also with it an operation and maintenance manual. Who writes that manual? The maker. We never question the right and authority of the maker to write that operation and maintenance manual, nor do we question the necessity for following that manual for safety, operation, and for the proper maintenance of that equipment. And if that equipment happened to be a more sophisticated piece, like an aeroplane, <coughs> we realize that the sincerity and the exactitude in following the manual becomes more crucial. Otherwise, you can get a serious accident. You could crash before you take off.
you have to follow it properly. And if we go in more complexity, not to say that humans are analogous to machines, but just to drive the point home, the human being, the most complex, the highest, the crown of creation of God on this earth, doesn't the human also need an operation and maintenance manual for their lives? We do. And as Muslims, we believe that earlier editions of that operation and maintenance manual of human life was revealed through different prophets, early scriptures, the final, most complete and well-preserved uh, version of that operation and maintenance manual for human life on earth is believed by Muslims to be uh, in the Quran, the last revealed uh, scripture to mankind. A second reason why Islam is mercy to the world is its universality. That's the issue that I'd like to spend perhaps a little more time on. First of all, <coughs> you look at the Quran and you find that it always speaks of universal God for all mankind. Nowhere in the Quran do you find a single reference that God is the God of the Israelites or Ishmaelites, Eastern or Western. From the very first surah in the Quran, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, praise be to God or Allah, the Lord of the worlds in plural, means the universe. To the last surah in the Quran, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ Say, O Muhammad, because the Quran is not written by Prophet Muhammad, he's told by God, and say, teach, O Muhammad, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind, not Arabs and non-Arabs or Eastern or Western. Linguistically speaking, even, the Arabic term for God, Allah, is much more accurate than the English term or French term, even though we, talk, we speak about the same supreme being of the universe. Because in the English language, for example, the term God is subject to plurality. You can speak about gods. Subject to gender, you can talk about God or goddess. In the Arabic language, linguistically speaking, there is no derivative from Allah. There is nothing equivalent to Allah's or Allah's, for example. And that's a much better uh, indication that God is above any gender or any form of plurality whatsoever. Secondly, <coughs> universality can be seen in the Quran in the way it depicts the mission of all of the prophets as one basic core message that is to invite mankind to submit to God, i.e., literally speaking, the meaning of the term Islam. No wonder the Quran says that all prophets taught Islam, that the prophet themselves were Muslims because the word Muslim means the one who consciously submit to God and is committed to his way of life. This kind of attitude ingrained in the Quran teaches true Muslims to have love and respect for all prophets and paves the way for acceptance and tolerance of people of other communities of faith, especially those that belong to the Abrahamic ethical monotheistic uh, faith. If uh, the followers of those religions are fighting among each other, that's their problem. But in fact, prophets, according to the Quran, were all one brotherhood, pursuing the same goal, the same objective, sent by the same Lord. And that's why you find parallels, parallels in the content of the Quran and what remained intact of previous scriptures. Not because someone copied from the other, but because the source is the same for all. Thirdly, we see that universality in the way the Quran speaks of mankind and explain the diversity of their colors and languages and ethnic grouping. One of the most beautiful quotations in the Quran appear in Surah 49 in passage 13, which reads in the translation, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and we made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know one another. Lo, the most noble of you, or honored of you in the sight of God, is one who is most righteous. I think four observations about that passage are in order. First, it does not say, O oh, Muslims, or O oh, Arabs, or O oh, Eastern or Western, but O oh, mankind, all of you, regardless of the diversity even of your religious convictions. Number two, 
<coughs> it reminds all mankind that they belong to one family because they all came from the same set of parents, one family diverse as it may be. Thirdly, it explains the diversity of people as a deliberate mosaic willed by God to encourage mutual understanding. This is confirmed elsewhere in the Quran in Surah 30. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Which means of the signs of God, the signs of His mercy, wisdom, is the creation of heavens and earth and the variations in your languages and your complexions. That's how the Quran explains races, not any notion of Samayit and Hamayit and all this, or that there is one race that is cursed, the other is superior. There is nothing like that. It is deliberate mosaic created. The way I look at it is like a bouquet of flower, where the white flower is beautiful in its own right. So is the yellow, the blue, the dark, but more beautiful is all of them together in the same bouquet. A third obs or fourth observation that it establishes a clear and fair objective criterion for any human being to strive for or to try to be better than someone else, not by race, color, wealth, gender, but as the Quran says, atqaqum, most righteous, a competition to which any person, any human being can sign up and compete fairly. A fourth aspect of universality is the way the Quran teaches Muslims to deal with non-Muslims. Again, it's, uh, it's the problem of Muslims to follow that. If they deviate from that, it is not because Islam teaches this. And you read in the Quran, in Surah 60, especially verses 8 and 9, a very crucial statement. Basically, it says, Allah does not forbid you, O Muslims, with respect to those who did not fight you because of your religion, or drive you out of your homes, that you should deal with them in kindness and justice, for God loves those who do good. We see that universality, fifthly, in the way the Quran deals with the concept of justice, universal justice, not Pax Romana type of justice for some group, uh, not others. And we read in the Quran, O believers, stand up for justice, witnesses for the sake of God, even if it may be against your own interest or those of your parents and close relatives. The Quran even requires justice with the enemy, do not let the hatred of others, the Quran says, don't let the hatred of others to you dissuade you from being just. Do justice, for that is closer to piety and righteousness. Sixthly, we see universality of Islam's message of mercy. When we noted, as we said earlier, that the Quran sums up the mission of the last prophet, Muhammad, peace be upon him, we have not sent you save as mercy to the worlds in plural universe. There are many words, in fact. There is the world of the human. There is the world of animals, as in the teaching of the Prophet also. He showed how to treat animals kindly. The Quran even speaks about the beauty of animals that God created. One time the Prophet was traveling with a group of companions, and somebody picked the small chicks of a bird. Watching the mother circling around in agony, the Prophet, peace be upon him, spoke very strongly to that man, rebuked him, and asked him to return back the chicks to their mother. One time he saw, among people who were war prisoners, a woman who was holding tight to her little baby. And he said, do you see the compassion and mercy of that mother to her child? They said, yes. He said, Allah, or God, is more merciful to mankind than this mother to her child. But it goes even beyond that to the, <coughs> the world of vegetation and plantation. As the Prophet وسلم, clearly echoes what the Quran says when he forbade people, even in the battlefield, to cut trees without any strategic necessity. In fact, the Quran itself draws our attention to appreciate the beauty let alone the, you know, the uh, edible quality of plantation. Not only this, it went to another world even, the world of inanimate object. 
In one time, the Prophet was passing by someone who was making ablution for prayers, to prepare for the prayers. And he was wasting so much money, uh, so much water. And the Prophet told him, what is this? What are you doing? He said, oh Prophet of God, could there be any excess even in water? Those people perhaps did not live in California and other places where there's a great dearth of water. Is there any excess in water? And the Prophet said, yes, even if you're making ablution from a running liver. Imagine tons of water that's teaching the proper use, not abuse of the resources. One can imagine if those normati normative teachings of Islam are heeded by humanity, what will happen to our world today? What will happen to the problem of premature depletion of limited resources, whether minerals and the destruction of forestry and others? These are very well laid down in the Quran, not because in the 1400 years ago, ecology was in fashion. It wasn't in fashion, but that we find already in documents that goes back 1400 years ago. The third characteristic, why <coughs> it is mercy to the world, excuse me, is it's what I call balanced comprehensiveness. Its, comprehension, its comprehensiveness uh, is found in the way it deals with human being, the human being as he or she is, a spiritual, physical, and intellectual being, and caters to all of those human elements in our existence and aspirations and achieve the highest possible fulfillment in all. It does not see the human as either an evolving animal devoid of spirit or a fallen angel, as either intellectual being, an intellectual being without spirituality, or a spiritual being void of any thinking. That comprehensiveness is also noted in defining Religion, the term religion in English is not the exact translation of the Arabic term used to be, or people believe to be equivalent, deen, D-W-E-N. Actually, the word deen in Arabic is not exactly religion, but a complete way of living, including, but not limited to, matters of belief, spirituality, worship, moral behavior, social, economic, and political aspects, all come under one jurisdiction, all are interrelated. As God is one, and the universe is one, the essential human nature is one, the fundamental needs of human beings, basics, are one, then the idea of compartmentalization of life in something spiritual or moral limited to the place of worship and the other that's political and another economic, that leads to psychological inconsistency or what psychologists call also dissonance. Dissonance lack of coordination, lack of coherence in human life, which is responsible for many of our psychological and psychiatric problems today. In fact, what the Quran is doing is to restore the ancient prayers attributed to Prophet Abraham as quoted in the Quran. Say, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are all devoted to God, Lord of the worlds. He has no partner. Thus have I been commanded by God, and I am the first, refer to Abraham, I am the first Muslim, the first one to submit to the will of God. <coughs> Alongside with this comprehensiveness is the quality of balance and avoidance of extremes. The Prophet spoke against extremes, regardless who uh, is committing those extremes, whether he claimed to be a Muslim, Jew, Christian, or anyone else. Extremes are contrary to the very spirit of Islamic teachings. We see that balance in a variety of ways. Few examples. The balance in the matter of belief and faith between two common extremes. One extreme, very common in our days, rationalism, not rationality, rationalism, worshipping rationality, scientism, that's different from science, and the restriction of all valid knowledge only to the sphere of the tangible. That's one extreme, extreme materialism. And forgetting that there is something supra-rational but not irrational, something beyond the scope of human knowledge. But on the other hand, it avoids the other extreme of asking people to believe 
in certain uh, myth in the name of mystery and faith to ask them to accept other man-made creeds which are totally unintelligible and easily proven to be false and demand that they accept that as a matter of faith even though it is not the faith that God revealed but what the hands of men did. In the Quran, faith and reason go hand in hand. Believing in the seen world and the unseen are not contradictory. Physical and spiritual existence is not a matter of either or because they all belong to that delicate balance. We see the balance in the matter of worship and devotion to God between materialism and neglect of offering thanks and grace to the one who provided for all on one hand and monasticism on the other hand, spending one's life making a shortcut from society and its concerns and engaging in one aspect of worship, the ritual worship, whereas the entire life, all productive activities in Islam qualify to be called worship. <coughs> we see the balance between the enjoyment, legitimate enjoyment of this life on earth and sacrificing now for better life in the eternal abode in paradise. As the Quran puts it, وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Seek in what Allah has given you the abode or place in the hereafter. Do not forget, however, your share in this life and be good as God has been good to you and seek no corruption on earth for God does not love those who are evildoers. In the Quran we read, eat and drink, of course, uh, non-alcoholic, but without excesses, for God does not love those who are extravagant and wasteful. We see that balance in the social, economic, and political life between the interest of the individual and the needs of society, <coughs> without sacrificing either on the altar of the other. You cannot sacrifice social needs in the name of individuality, resulting in injustice and instability and lack of compassion, nor can you crush the individuality in the name of collectivity. Needless to say that in all of these examples and others of balance, the only one who can define the proper balance, the correct balance, is not you and me or any other philosopher. It is the creator of all of us who knows the ins and outs of human nature, its needs and what's good for it that can provide that balance. Coming to the final part, a fourth reason <coughs> is not only on the issue of relating us to our creator or the universal message in variety of ways that we looked at or comprehensiveness and balance alone, but even in the physical aspect of life, we find normative Islam contributed tremendously to the material progress of mankind. In his book, The Making of Humanity, Rob Briefo states, quote, it is highly probable that po but for the Arabs, this is a big mistake when you use the term Arabs, a lot of writers use the term Arabs, but they mean by that actually Muslims. And this is the common misconception a lot of people have that Muslim means Arab. The Arabs are a small minority, less than 20% of the Muslim world population. The largest Muslim country in the world is not an Arab country, Indonesia, with nearly 165 to maybe 170 million Muslims. The Muslim minority, minority in India is twice as large as the largest Arab Muslim country, which is Egypt. These are facts that a lot of people in the media perhaps are not aware of, and the same stereotype of Muslim means Arab. So the same problem was before anyway. But he continues to say, had it not been for that, modern European civilization would have never risen at all. Later he says, there is no aspect of European growth in which decisive influence of Islamic culture is not traceable. What we call science today, he says, <coughs> excuse me, arose in Europe as a result of a new spirit of inquiry, a new method of investigation, the method of experimentation, observation, measurement of the development of mathematics in forms unknown to the Greeks, that spirit 
and those methods were introduced in the European world by, he used the term Arabs again, meaning Muslims. I may add to this, that that new spirit that Briofo uh, speaks about was actually sparked by no less than the Quran and the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first word revealed in the Quran, not sentence, word, iqra, which means read or recite, paradoxically revealed to a person who was himself unlettered. It also teaches that those who are endowed with knowledge are better in the sight of God if they combine knowledge with faith. Ingredients of what we call today the scientific approach are found in the Quran as it urges the use of reason. It demands evidence. It urges mankind to explore, <coughs> explore the natural phenomena and to wisely utilize natural resources for its benefit as the trustee of God on this earth. The understanding and implementation of that new spirit gave rise to a thriving civilization whose golden age lasted for five centuries, from the eighth century to the fall of Baghdad in 1258, 13th century. And for two more centuries, a total of seven, in Muslim Spain until the fall of Grenada in the late part of the 15th century. Following are a few examples of Muslim contribution to civilization in this period. Muslim astronomers <coughs> were able to draw maps of visible stars, correct the sun and moon tables, and were actually the first to use the pendulum to measure time and the first to build observatories in the east and west. They predicted sunspots, eclipses, and the appearance of comets. Early Muslim chemists, as early as the 8th and 9th century of the Common Era, discovered the nitric acid, described the properties of sulfuric acid, and the operations of distillation, sublimation, filtration, coagulation, and crystallization. They applied their knowledge of chemistry in the making of plasters, syrups, ointments, and tempering of steel. Actually, many common terms that we have today in English, such as camphor, elixir, alkali, syrup, and alcohol, all originated from Arabic terms, which was the international language of knowledge, the lingua franca for science and education, in the same way that today, for example, English, uh, French, and German are the language of culture and science. <coughs> Advancements were made <clears throat> in the manufacturing of fabrics, silk, cotton, wool, leather, glass, uh, steel, drugs, paper, and perfumes. Muslim contribution to mathematics were immense. It included the popularization of what came to be known as the Arabic numerals that started in initially in India. And that led to the revolutionizing of mathematics. The preservation of the work of Euclid in geometry is attributed to Muslim mathematicians also, as well as the development of trigonometry in its modern form, including the first to use the sine and cosine. Algebra, in fact, is an Arabic term. Literally, it means to put the broken pieces together. If somebody has a broken arm or something, you go to have algebra on it to, to put the pieces. This is the basic concept in algebra. The term logarithm came from the name of the famous 9th uh, century Muslim mathematician Muhammad al-Khawarizmi. Logarism, Khawarizmi. Ibn al-Haytham's or al hazin as known in the West, uh, had a very important piece of work on optics in the 11th century, which was described by George Sarton, one of the foremost historians of science, as the beginning of the modern science of optics, to which now we uh, owe the cameras and TV and all the trappings of our modern life. The work of al hazin or al Ibn al-Haytham <coughs> exerted great influence on Western sciences and showed great progress in the experimental method 
long before Roger Bacon, to whom normally or commonly uh, experimental methods or scientific approach is attributed. The making of the compass and its use in navigation is attributed as well to Muslim physicists. As early as the 9th century, the Caliph al mamun estimated the circumference, notice here, we talk about the 9th century, and we're using the term circumference of the earth. And he came up with a figure that is amazingly close to the figure we use today using the most sophisticated equipment, 24,000 miles. Muslim geographers, perhaps inspired by references in the Quran that the earth is spheric, there are several references in the Quran, were able actually to study geography on globes when Europe was still arguing about the earth being flat. Ar Razi, or known as Razis in the West, the chief physician of Baghdad in the 9th century, is regarded as one of the greatest physicians in the Middle Ages by historians of science. <coughs> According to Jean Draper, Ar Razi's immense medical encyclopedia remained among the most important medical references in Europe for 600 years. His works on measles and smallpox were translated as late as the 18th century to European languages. Another giant of medicine, who was also a philosopher at the same time, is Ibn Sina, or known in the West also as Avicenna, of the 11th century, who wrote a five-volume work on medicine, Qanun fi tib or Canon in Medicine, which remained as the supreme authority on medicine, the Bible of medicine, for 600 years and became the basis for medical standards, especially in Italian and French universities. As early <coughs> as the 11th century, Muslim surgeons treated cataract, hemorrhage, and used cauterization. One of the most interesting things is that oftentimes the discovery of the circulatory system is attributed to William Harvey. And centuries before him, more precisely in the 13th century, a Syrian physician by the name of Ibn Nafis is the one actually who discovered the minor circulatory system. Finally, three examples of the influence of Islamic art, architecture, and calligraphy. On the doors of some cathedrals was inscribed the Islamic expression, Ma Sha Allah, which means as God wills. Islamic style mosaic was found in a number of churches in France, in Auvergne. And an Anglo-Saxon golden coin, or coins actually, many coins, some were found in Scandinavia and other places, carried on one side King Offa Rex of Mercia. On the other side was inscribed in Arabic the Muslim testimony of faith, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. I wonder whether uh, King Offa was secretly a Muslim or whether those who coined it did not realize what they were doing. They just admired the calligraphy of that testimony uh, of faith. Uh, an, er an equally interesting uh, matter is related to an Irish cross from the 9th century, which is now found in the British Museum, which is decorated in the middle with the inscription Bismillah, in the name of Allah. A very curious way of interfaith uh, relations. In conclusion, I must say that it was a great joy and honor to share those few humble thoughts with you in as little time as possible in preparation for what should be more interesting, perhaps the two-way communication and question and answer. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, our next is a question and answer sessions. Um, if anybody has any questions they would like to ask Dr. Jamal Badawi, um, you can raise your hands and uh, you'll be called upon. And we'd like, since uh, there isn't any microphones, we'd like, we would appreciate it if you can uh, talk in a louder voice. Um, any questions from anybody? Yes. Um, 
Dr. Ahmad is referring to uh, one verse in the Quran whose translation goes like this. We means God speak. By the way, we here means royal language, not multiplicity in God or anything. We will show them our signs in the horizons, that's in the discoveries in this universe, and in themselves. It could be a reference to physiology, biology, embryology, so that they may realize that it is, which is understood to mean the Quran, is the truth. It is not a book written by any human, but truth that comes from God. Um, those of you who might be particularly interested in this, I understand that uh, on Saturday in the international, Miami International University, uh, God willing, I'll be making a presentation that would amaze anyone regardless of religious background. It's on embryology in the Quran using uh, uh, transparencies and a number of slides, some of which were taken from inside the wombs of mothers. That's a very fascinating topic in itself uh, where, inshallah, or God willing, we will be showing that some of the description given in early embryonic stages, information pertaining even to genetics, are described in very precise terms in the Quran that was revealed 1400 years ago and long time before the discovery of the microscope, let alone electronic microscopes. I, you might get information maybe at the end about the location and the time. <coughs> but this is not the only area. This area perhaps referred to that part of the verse that says, Wafi and Fusim, and in themselves. But in the horizons also, you find a number of amazing things. I alluded to one very quickly during the presentation that tried to make very concentrated, really. In the Quran, for example, uh, and we're talking here for the 7th century of the Common Era, it is quite clear that the earth is spheric. When the Quran uses the term, which means God coils the day over the night and coils the night over the day. How could you speak of coiling unless you really talk about a spheric uh, shape? When the Quran says that Allah merges, eulage, eulage al layl al-nahar, Allah merges the day into the night and merges the night into the day. You people drive cars, you know what merge means. Merge, don't move abruptly from one lane to the other, but smoothly, gradually. And you cannot think of gradualness if you have that perception that the earth is flat, the sun comes from here and go to sleep at the end of the day there. What, what is the merging here? There's nothing that relate to merging. Merging can only make sense when you talk about any point on the globe that has a particular point of day and night that gradually and smoothly uh, keep uh, rotating and, and changing. So these are only you know, like a few examples. There you can go on. You could have a separate topic altogether on the matter of the uh, science and how the Quran spoke about <coughs> not scientific theories that change from time to time, but uh, verified and verifiable scientific facts. I'm not theories, I underline facts. And that actually uh, led one of the uh, French authors, Dr. Maurice Bouquet, to write a whole book on that subject. It's called The Bible, the Quran, and Science, in which he quoted various references in both scriptures that pertain to established science. And he concludes that, to his amazement, that not a single reference to scientific facts made in the Qur'an was ever proven to be inaccurate. And that is quite unique to the case of, uh, of the Qur'an. So those who are interested, I think it's available. It was published by the American Trust publication and should be available with the Muslim Student Association on campus here. But I would say that the most definitive one, perhaps, is what some of you might wish to uh, watch on uh, Saturday, God willing. <coughs> yes. Because of the universal theme of Islam and uh, the universal justice, um, which also brings 
Hadith that the brother referring to or saying of the Prophet, <coughs> it says that the Prophet says, I have been commanded to fight people until they bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that I am his messenger. If they do that, their property and their lives will be sanctified, except in due process of law, like for example, the payment of zakah or charity, which support the funds of the states. But their accountability lies with Allah. The scholars of hadith, with very strong evidence, concluded that that hadith actually applies only to people in Arabia, for a reason that I'm going to give. But what is their basis? Their basis that the style in the Arabic language, which is also found in the Quran, that sometimes a term which has a general meaning, but is used for a specific meaning. Those of you who are familiar with the Quran, for example, there is one verse that says, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ It says they were told that people have gathered armies to fight against you. And obviously the term people here does not mean all human beings on the earth. All in Arabia, it was actually in reference to a particular group of tribes that were hostile to Islam and were amassing an army to, uh, to attack Muslims. So the word nas or people, even though it could be translated mankind, in a given context, when you put it, like you said, in the proper context, actually it refers only to a limited number of people, a limited number of tribes. So that hadith was interpreted to apply particularly to the, the uh, Arabs who knew the Prophet because they are different from any others, number one. They could not say, we cannot understand what this Prophet is teaching because they speak Arabic. Number two, <coughs> they cannot, and many honest persons amongst them, even though they remained unbelievers, could not help but admit that the style of the Qur'an is utterly inimitable and even with their collective wisdom and skill in Arabic poetry and prose, they could not match the Qur'an, even a small part of it. Which means that if somebody else who doesn't speak Arabic can say, all right, the miracle of the Qur'an in that respect is irrelevant to me, it was very clear to them because that was their bread and butter. Number three, they could not say, we don't know this prophet, where he came from because they know everything about his history, about his absolute honesty and purity. He lived among them, he was raised as a child until he reached the age of maturity and began to receive revelation. Which means then, and these people again, another reason, important one, they were not people of the book who would say, all right, we believe in God in any way, but in our own way. There was no excuse for them to continue insisting that these idols are really the creator, the ones that uh, are intermediaries between man and God or that they have any authority in this universe. And to keep insisting on that actually meant that they were harboring <coughs> aggressive intentions against Muslims and that's exactly what happened. They kept fighting against them, they kept betraying their treaties and their commitment to Muslims and they represented a great danger. So that is applicable only to those. But the basic rule is the one that you quite rightfully cited in Surah 2 in the Quran there is let be no compulsion in religion. But these people have no reason at all, and there was a matter of security for that particular time. One cannot extend that to apply it to any other human being because the verse that you refer to, no compulsion in religion, is not the only one in the Quran. Likewise, the Quran says to the Prophet, remind, you are only a reminder, you're not sent as a guardian over them. The Quran also says, this is the truth from your Lord, whoever wishes, to believe, let him believe. Whoever wishes to reject faith, let him reject faith. But it speaks about the hereafter as the abode uh, where everything will be decided. Whoever wishes to believe, let him believe. Whoever wishes to reject faith, let him reject faith. We have no authority to force. It's totally contrary even to the definition of Islam as, as I called it, willing, loving, conscious, trusting submission to God. How do you submit to God if these some sword over your neck. 
It doesn't make any sense. It creates hypocrites, not believers. <coughs> yes, brother. Bismillah, rahmatullah. Or you want me to repeat? Basically, the question <coughs> says that in the Quran, I paraphrase it just to make it clearer. In the Quran, it says that God announced to the angels that I'm going to create a trustee on earth, means the human race. So the angel said to God, are you going to create someone who's going to create mischief and bloodshed on this earth? And then God responded, I know what you know not. And uh, the brother's question here is this. Does that mean that there were other creatures before us, like humans on earth, who corrupted the earth, and that's why the angels were afraid that the same story is going to be repeated? That's your question, right? The answer to that is simple. There are some people who interpret it this way, but the interpretation that I'm more inclined to is that the angels are intelligent beings, after all, very intelligent beings, and they are pure beings. And when they realize that these new creatures will be created also from dust, not like them from light, they were able easily to conclude that anyone who lives on earth and have to deal with the dust, that there are attraction to that dust. There is the attraction of sex, of food, striving for power and wealth. And if that strive is going to take place, there is likely to be conflict because humans will not be as perfect as angels are. They knew that these will not be perfect beings. And as such, there is likelihood of mischief and evil on this earth. So both interpretations are offered. I'm inclined to the second one. I'll, but of course, I cannot deny that the other one could be a possibility, that there might have been other, some kind of creatures, but uh, that doesn't seem to be likely, but possible only. Um, I believe his hand was up first. She's next. Wa alaykum as salam. My question is with... A lot of negative thinking of Islam and Muslims get. Uh, here recently, uh, I attended a time with my master, and the Imam uh, spoke on war on Muslims in America. Secret societies, governments. I'd like to know your sentiments on that. The media attitude towards Muslims, it is rather unfortunate, and that's why I was talking earlier about media uh, stereotypes. Let me give you one example, and I'm not, I'm not going to any, use any strong term. I use whatever term to designate it. But, for example, <clears throat> when a Jew killed Rabin, you did not find big letters in the newspaper saying Judaic terrorism or Jewish terrorism killed Rabin. And I'm not suggesting that this should be the case. When David Koresh in the Waco incident committed whatever act they committed, including murder, nobody came in the paper and said, Christian terrorism. They call it Davidian branch, cult. Only when the matter relates to somebody from Muslim background or Arabian background, that the name of Islam is deliberately dragged. Not only sometimes they're saying Muslim terrorist or Muslim fundamentalist, whatever other term, sometimes you use the term even Islamic terrorism. It's just like saying this is Judaic terrorism that is emanating from Judaism. This is Christian terrorism that means Christianity. Obviously, it gives that impression. Islamic terrorism, it's something related to Islam somehow and connected with the normative teaching of the. That's why I included that as part of the introduction. So that shows that there are different standards. For other religions, say, all right, no, religion doesn't teach that. These are freaks, that there is fringe uh, people, fanatical, violent fringe in any religion. So that's fine, we can excuse that. But only in the case of Islam, no. The, the, there is no need to admit that there could be also a fanatical or violent fringe among Muslims like any other followers of any other religions at any point of time. No, it has to be Islamic. The name has to be always uh, put in the picture. And then you get those self-styled experts who make very irresponsible statements 
resulting in great damage to the Muslim community in North America. People like Steve Emerson appearing being like a hot cake after the Oklahoma City bombing. That this carries the fingerprints of Middle Eastern terrorism and obviously people and the rumors spread uh, some Middle Eastern looking people and I don't know and by any stretch of imag imagination if McVeigh looked like a Middle Eastern, you know. I don't know, Middle Eastern within Canada, within the United States, maybe Midwestern or Middle Eastern, but not within the, within the world. Uh, but the point here, irresponsible statements like that, even the uh, speculation, but I'm not talking about uh, media people in training, that's no problem, I'm talking about the, those who deliberately are committing those distortion. And as a result, you hear until today even about destruction and burning of Muslim mosques, attack physically on them, a woman who lost her child because during the Oklahoma City things, they, they, she was, they, her house was stoned and the glass were, were broken, she was so scared. This is the kind of irresponsibility that, uh, in spite of the effort now of some organizations and the good work done by CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, we find that great deal of irresponsibility resulting from that baggage, or God knows, maybe there might be some cases where some people are deliberately, like Emerson and others, deliberately presenting a dishonest pre picture of Islam and try to incite hatred against the Muslim community in North America and elsewhere. I'm, I'm sorry to be frank, but I have to. Um, this is one of the questions in the card. With reference to food, does halal include McDonald's, hamburgers, or Burger King, Kentucky Fried Chicken, etc.? The Quran says the food of the people of the book is permitted unto you, and your food is permitted unto them. But there is another verse in the Quran also that says, don't eat from what the name of Allah has not been mentioned on it, and it is an abomination. <coughs> and pe some people take the first verse as the basic guiding line the, in their interpretation, some scholars, others take the second. But let me add a humble little observation that resolve that difference of opinion and to show where it came from. The reason of revelation, and I like the point made earlier, you have to put things in their proper context. You don't take something out of context and make interpretation for it. Ibn Kathir, the famous commentator on the Quran, says that the occasion of revelation of that second verse, don't eat from what the name of Allah has not been mentioned, mean at the time of killing, was revealed in the context of an argument that some Jews in Medina raised, a rhetorical argument with Muslims. They said to Muslims, is what your knife kill I mean, when you kill the animal and say the name of God, it is lawful. And what the knife of God kills is unlawful. By the knife of God, they meant the, um, the animal that dies by itself, the, the animal that caused, uh, or caused to die because of God's will, but without any slaughtering. So the ayah or that verse was revealed to respond to them. It says, don't eat from what the name of Allah has not been mentioned on it. In that context, according to Ibn Kathir, it is in reference to the animal that dies by itself. Because normally when a Muslim kills an animal, you have to say the name of God. And if you continue the remaining part of the verse, it explains it. <coughs> because it says, وَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ لَا يُوحُونَ إِلَىٰ أَوْلِيَائِهِمْ لِيُجَادِلِكُمْ Satans or devil, evil ones inspire their league to argue with you. If you obey them, you are mushriks, you deviate from the path. Which shows then that there is no contradiction between the two opinions if you put it in context. Furthermore, one more comment. Quran must be understood in the light of authentic hadith. And in Sahih al-Bukhari, indisputably the most authentic collection of hadith of the Prophet There is a hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha, in which she said that some people brought, came to the Prophet. They were new Muslims. And they said, people bring us the meat. And we don't know whether they said the name of God on it when they killed it or not. What was the Prophet's answer? He didn't say, no, this is haram, don't eat it. He said, Sammu wa kulu. Say, you say Bismillah and eat. Having said that much, I still prefer the blessing of having an animal killed with the name of Allah mentioned on it. And in big communities like here, I think it should be possible also to get meat with the proper prayers said on it. But it doesn't mean that other meat, which is basically halal, non pork and permissible, that is killed by people of the book. Uh, is not permissible. But there are both opinions and there should be tolerance. If someone feels more comfortable following one or the other, there should be mutual respect and appreciation that it is based on sound reasoning both ways anyway. I have a number of written questions here, but I think there's a lady here who is ready. Uh, 
Which ones, I'm sorry? No, I didn't say it's, uh, something has the Quranic inscription. Are you referring? Oh, you mean the, the cross? No, I haven't seen them myself, but there is a report on that, for example, in um, Philip Hitti's uh, book, The History of the Arabs. He has actually a picture of, uh, of that coin. And these others were reported also in other references. But I haven't seen it in the museum itself, but that's how. Uh, other references uh, either have a picture or refer to them. Okay. Uh, just recently, astronomers have identified a distant star and revolving satellites. Do you have any comments on this grand discovery? It doesn't surprise me as a Muslim at all. In fact, in the Quran, there is one interesting verse that some people misinterpret it because they're so mechanical in the translation. Allah is the one who created, if you translate it literally, it says seven heavens and of the earth like number. The number seven in the Arabic language <coughs> does not always mean just numerical seven, but it's used lil kathra, as the linguists say, many, that Allah created many earths uh, and many heavens. And the word heaven actually means anything that's above us. That's one thing. Secondly, the Quran itself make references to the vastness of the creation of Allah and that the entire universe even as we know it as we see it might not be the entire universe there is something always beyond that look at this amazing verse in the Quran God says I swear by the position or places of stars and it is a very ominous and great uh, swearing if indeed you understand that means there is something really beyond our human imagination. The Quran just gives us a glimpse when in one verse it says the good deeds are sent to God in a day whose measure is 50,000 years of your reckoning. It doesn't mean that we have to take 50,000 years in the very rigid sense or in another verse where it's about 1,000 years. It just shows us what we call today the theory of relativity. That the time, matter of time, is relative, number one. It shows us also that when you speak about the vastness of heavens, you're really talking about, you see, angels going at very fa fast speed, taking 50,000 years to ascend in the reckoning or the time that we reckon here on earth. So it doesn't surprise us. The Quran encourages us to explore. It is not against the will of God. It is not encroachment on his domain to understand his universe. That's a different attitude that Islam provides. That's why we have so much progress in Islamic astronomy or Muslim astronomy early. <coughs> should continue with this. <coughs> Okay, what are we, what do we mean by interfaith? Is the purpose of it is to convert the other group? Please comment on some of its benefits. By interfaith, we mean opening communication with people who happen not to choose Islam or happen not to be born Muslims. And Islam by its very nature is a dialogical religion. It is not a closed religion. It's not like say, this is the religion of the Arabs or this locality of the world. Unless you're a Hindu born in India, for example, it's very difficult really. How do you become a Hindu? You know, for example, Islam is a universal religion for all mankind. And the same thing applies here. Uh, the Quran says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْ Say, O Muhammad, to the people of the book, come. Come to what? The discussion. To a common term between you and us. And then it specifies the worship of the one God and so on. So it invites for dialogue. If Islam stands again as dialogue or discussion with the people of the book other than just notion of conversion, why is it then that the Quran says, وَلَا تُجَادِلُوا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنِ Argue not with the people of the book. How do you argue unless you have a dialogue or discussion? You make your argument, they make their argument. If it is conversion, come, let me convert you, the Quran would not use the term argue. Why argue? That means there are two sides. Somebody says, no, Jesus is my savior. He's God in human form. I say, no, Jesus is a great prophet. What is your evidence? What's my evidence? Argue. That means exchange between the two, which means by the text of the Quran, Muslims are encouraged to argue. But it says, argue in ways that are best. But then you go on further to show that it's not just a matter of instruction or conversion, but opening dialogue with open heart, with mutual respect. 
You continue with the same verse. What does it say? وَقُولُوا آمَنَّا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ إِلَيْنَا وَأُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَإِلَاهُنَا وَإِلَاهُكُمْ وَاحِدْ وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ And say to them, the people of the book, we believe in what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to you. Does that contradict what the Quran say elsewhere that the revelation has not been fully preserved except in the case of the Quran? No. But it brings to our attention that we should not be fanatical and closed-minded. That there could be still some ports, parts, of the revelation given to previous prophet like Moses and Jesus, which is consistent with the Quran. And as one who studied both the Bible and the Quran, I see a great deal of similarity, which means, yes, there could be some problems with people adding their own religious experience or theological speculation, fine. But there is something that you can find as a common ground between both communities. And then it says, Wa ilahu, our God and yours is one. If one is thinking in a very narrow way, you say, no, the God of Islam is not the God of Christians. The God of Islam doesn't have trinity, doesn't incarnate. Yes, Allah knows. Allah who revealed that Quran knows and doesn't approve of that. But still, the fact that he draws our attention, that the God of Christians and Jews and Muslims is one, is to say, yes, there are things we don't agree with. But the notion of the oneness of God, you must be fair and honorable and not accusing Christian that they worship three gods. That's tritheism, not trinity. You, you can disagree with the trinity. But the notion of the oneness of God as the supreme being is there, and that's a common ground. Then you can talk about differences. It's fine. So by, in, by its very nature, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself, and that's an evidence from Sunnah, engaged in dialogue. It was not conversion, because these were a group of Christians <coughs> from Najran, which is now in Yemen, who came to Medina to inquire about that person who is claiming to be a new prophet, what his teachings are. And he invited them in his own mosque. Imagine what happened in some places where the entry of a mosque of non-Muslims is frowned upon. The prophet himself, who cannot be more sincere and more respectful to Islam and to mosque than the prophet, he invited them in his own mosque. And he dialogued with them. He didn't say, listen to me, let me instruct you. They talk also about their belief. And he responded in history. You read that in Sira. They exchanged and he gave evidence. They talk about it. He replied to them. He didn't say, keep quiet and just listen to me and be converted. He never did that. Even it is said by some historian that when their time of prayer, they wanted to take, to excuse themselves to go out of the mosque. He said, why? He said, he said this is our time we want to do our prayer. He said, you're welcome to do your prayer in my mosque. Their own prayer in the mosque. See the openness and the sense of, uh, of compassion and mutual respect, so long as there is no aggression or enmity uh, on, on their part. So who can say that the dialogue uh, or interfaith activities is... Unless, of course, you talk about an extreme case where, you know, there is a different agenda and Muslims are used in that. But that's not the case. Uh, for myself, I have been engaged happily in dialogues for many, many years in this country, in several countries overseas. And I see a great deal of benefit of that. I see lots of good spirit that is generated. Forget about conversion. The guidance is in the hand of God. But at least to get people to understand each other is in itself a good contribution to the kind of peaceful world that we are all striving to reach. Is evolutionary theory compatible with Islam, the Big Bang? <coughs> well, there are two issues in the same question. As far as the notion of the Big Bang, I have to say something, but carefully. Remember I said earlier there is no single statement in the Quran that is in conflict with any established scientific fact. But when you talk about the origin of the universe, you have to be more careful because that's theory, and theories could change. Nobody was there to record it on video camera or anything of that nature. But there is something interesting with caution that we find in the Quran. And the text of the verse in Arabic says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا أَنَّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ كَانَتَا رَتْقًا فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ Don't the unbelievers or rejecters of faith know or see, actually see, that the heavens and earth were all one part and then we split them asunder 
and we made out of water everything living. Quite interesting. The whole universe was one gaseous mass, according to that theory. From that, you get the galaxies, various systems, solar systems, and so on. But again, I take that with a precaution. So there is no, no problem. If that theory is proven, there is no contradiction with the Quran at all. Secondly, the question of evolution, that's a different issue. There is no text in the Quran or saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that I know of, <coughs> that says or implies that there could have been absolutely no evolution whatsoever on any level. And if someone tell me that it is quite possible or plausible that there was evolution from a single cell up to the highest of apes, I'd say no problem. The Quran doesn't say it, doesn't deny it. It's open. There's no contradiction. The only thing, the only thing that can be interpreted from the Quran is that even if there were evolution, the human being in particular did not evolve from the apes. I usually say, unless somebody is so, so proud to have the apes as his ancestors, that's up to them. But it says the human being is created with special qualities, not just something evolved, but God breathed. The Quran says God breathed something of his spirit into the human being. And interesting enough, and I'm not a specialist in the field, the specialist can speak better than me in this, the greatest and more conclusive scientific evidence of evolution is found much on the lower level because of the existence of fossils and many uh, you know proofs seem to indicate it and the most difficult and most controversial is between the highest of apes and the human the weight of the brain and discovery more recently of a human being who uh, was believed to be much much before what they believed i understand there was a recent discovery i was Exactly, that uh, uh, the uh, dinosaurs and humans coexisted. And that's quite interesting. That would be fully in line with the Quran. Okay, you could have been evolution, but God chose. And nobody can scientifically, conclusively reject the possibility that there were evolution for some animals, but some, side by side, the human also was created. So this is an area which is open, but I don't see any problem at all with it. Okay. <coughs> As it has been mentioned that the rights of Allah can be forgiven, but the rights of fellow human beings cannot be forgiven unless forgiven by the person himself. What's your idea about that? No, it's not my idea. It's the Prophet, peace be upon him, explained this, and the Quran speaks about the question of forgiveness. But basically it says that God is very merciful. And it says he will for accept the repentance of any person until his soul is leaving the moment of death when every truth is seen clearly by the dying person. It's too late at that time. In another hadith says, God will forgive until the sun comes from the west, means a symbol of the beginning of the day of judgment, because again the truth become manifest at that time. But there are only three conditions really, but could be four in some cases. The condition for acceptance of repentance is number one, to stop whatever wrong one is doing. Number two, to re regret what one did because that's a sign of humility and acceptance that this was not right to do. Number three, to have a determination not to repeat that again. But if the sin committed by the person involved the right of some other person, then he should seek forgiveness of that person. If, for example, I stole something from someone else, I can repent to God, yes, but I have to return the stolen item to the person or seek his forgiveness in case it has been consumed. But of course, if you've done something wrong to someone and repented to Allah and you went to that person and say, no, I'm not going to forgive you. I enjoy seeing you in the hellfire. Then you can, that's what you could do. It is not, you are not to be blamed. You compensate by paying charity or being good, but Allah will forgive you. So it's not meant to be capricious. And the Prophet also told that if someone asks for your forgiveness, you should give it. Actually, in one hadith, he condemned those you know, hard-headed people who would not forgive others even though people apologize to them. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. As one question says, with respect to Christians who exist today, um, are they to be regarded as people of the book even though they associate Jesus, peace be upon him, with God by claiming that he is the son of God. Yes, 
they are people of the book in spite of that belief. There is a weak opinion that is attributed to one of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Abdullah ibn Umar, that the other companions did not agree with him, other scholars did not agree with him. That he said, how could the Christian, for example, be people of the book when they say that Jesus is the Son of God? But that is because Abdullah ibn Umar was not a scholar of comparative religion and history of religions. The notion of Trinity and the notion of Jesus being the only begotten Son of God is something that preceded the birth of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by more than 300 years. It was 325 in the Council of Nicaea when this became an official doctrine. And before that also, it can be traced somehow in the writing of some of the disciples. Allah knew that, but he still called them people of the book. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, treated them, Jews and Christians, as people of the book. And there is no shred of historical evidence to say that the Qur'an meant by people of the book or Christians only the small group in early Christian history known as Unitarian, not like today's Unitarian Christians, Unitarian Christians who believed in Jesus as a human being. There is no evidence historically. And people in Arabia and the Christian who met the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, from Najran, and were called in the Qur'an people of the book, were Christians who do not belong to Unitarians. They believed also in Jesus as the Son of God, yet they were regarded as people of the book. So there's no question that yes, they are people of the book in spite of it. It doesn't mean that we agree with the notion of only begotten Son or Trinity, but it doesn't mean that they are not people. The reason they are called people of the book is that they share with us the fact that the origin of their faith was based on a revealed book or scripture from Allah. And if you say that only the people of the book who believe in the absolute oneness of Allah, the way Muslims understand it, are to be regarded people of the book, they might as well be Muslims. <laughs> Why should they make a distinction? They would not be people of the book, they would be Muslims. If they remove all the notion of sonship of Jesus to God, that God, Jesus was God incarnate, if that is removed from their beliefs, they're Muslims. So why the Quran mentioned, bother to talk about people of the book? Okay. But that's different from, he says, uh, the question about things like Baha'ism. No, for the case of uh, Baha'ism or Qadianism, the Quran is clear that Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger of God. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it clearly, La nabiyya ba'di, there is no prophet after me. And by the way, the word prophet is more general than messenger, which means nobody after me can claim to be either prophet or messenger because prophet covers all whether messenger or prophet as terminology used is, is none. So Muslims would respectfully say that uh, we don't believe that there was any prophet or need for a prophet or new scripture after the Quran. It is preserved. It is complete. <coughs> you mentioned rationalism. Is it safe to say that Allah is everywhere because our understanding of everywhere is limited and that would then limit Allah's attributes? You see, to say that Allah is everywhere, I wouldn't use that expression. Because that sounds more like pantheism, al-hulul, falsafat al-hulul. And it could lead some people to believe that if Allah is everywhere and is in everything, then as for example in the Hindu faith, to my understanding, Allah is in the animals, in the elephant, in the monkey, in the every, because he's everywhere. That's why sometimes the notion of not killing certain animals or for food even, might possibly be based on that. So I would avoid use the term Allah is everywhere. But if you say the presence of Allah is everywhere, that's different. The Allah has his own entity, and Allah doesn't have a space, lim not limited by space or time, like our limited thinking. But you say his presence is there, that means Allah, according to the Quran, hears everything, sees everything, so there is no place that his presence and his knowledge and his will is not active. But exactly uh, when you say where is Allah, that's an issue that one should really stop at because we have limitation. Even at the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, one simple woman, he was asking her, where is Allah, where is God? And she pointed to heaven. And he did, never rebuked her. Because in the, her instinctive, natural feeling, maybe by pointing up, not to say that Allah has a special place up, but that, you know, beyond this earth, you know, there is something higher than me, higher than the universe. 
So in that even simple understanding, the Prophet never rebuked her for that. <coughs> Islam inspired a group of people to graceness, as we have mentioned. However, since the 18th, 19th century, Muslims are identified as third-class people, sword-wielding fanatics, and now terrorists. Any comment as to how to recapture the golden age? Of course, I, I answered the issue of uh, terrorism or extremism uh, without any justification. Of course, a lot of these violent acts is not because somebody decided in the womb of his mother to be born terrorist, but because of acts of injustice and cruelty which lead people to commit these acts that are not permissible by Islam, but sometimes they find themselves pushed against the wall. When people's rights are taken, when their bones, limbs are deliberately broken, when they are killed, shot in the back in peaceful demonstration, when their homes are bulldozed, and some of them simply you know, get so mad as to what happened to them and their families and their children and act in certain ways, it doesn't justify it, but we should not just say that because they are born cruel and born terrorist in that sense. But as far as the question of the golden age, well, the, the formula, the prescription is the same. When Islam came, the Muslims and Arabs, particularly the beginning of the mission, were very backward as compared to every place in the world. They didn't have any history of great civilizations or scientific contributions. Within a span of less than 100 years, they were ruling half of the world and they have this amazing contribution that continued for six and a half centuries. You see, according to George Sarton, the Muslim contribution to science or scientists, Muslim scientists were the most prominent for nearly 300 years, three to 350 years, and were among the top three scientists world over for another 300 years. So you're talking about really a total of 650 years of amazing prominence in science. That is much longer than when the Western civilization has been prominent. So the prescription was basically that you got people who were committed to Islam, it didn't go to extremes. They were hardworking, they were sincere about it, they were able to really to make that great contribution and show great tolerance as we have seen in the court of Spain and the, the house of wisdom in Baghdad where you get scientists from all religions, from all backgrounds in the highest position cooperating together for the benefit of humanity at large. So the, the prescription is the, is the same. But what's happening in the Muslim world today is lack of commitment on the part of individuals, dictatorial governments that scuttle any creativity. But when individual Muslims are given the opportunity, in North America, among the top scientists are Muslims. Farooq al-Baz as one who was very, was very influential in the landing on the moon, the geologist, the designer, of the uh, architect of the Sears Tower in Chicago is a Bangladeshi Muslim and, and understand the renovation in the Chicago airport, uh, in the uh, Miami airport actually uh, was done or a uh, project made by a Muslim. So there are lots of making great contribution in their fields when they're away from the oppressive system uh, in, their, uh, in their countries and giving the opportunity. So the prescription is the same. Follow the footsteps of predecessors. It says, I'm a Muslim <coughs> and confused about the Israeli-Palestine, Palestinian problem. Please explain the correct Islamic stance. What should be done for the Palestinians and done to the current Israelis? Well, one of the uh, things that seem to have affected a lot of people because of the extensive and intensive Zionist propaganda for decades the Jews were the original inhabitants of Palestine and they're simply recovering the land of their ancestors. And as such, uh, Muslims and possibly Christians are just invaders. They're just recovering the biblical land promised to them. This is false on theological and historical basis in addition to international law. It is false theologically because even a Christian, a Jewish rabbi like Rabbi Ermel, Elmer Berger in a book, booklet of his shows that when the Bible even speaks about the land promised to the descendants of Abraham, he admits that Muslims also are descendants of Abraham. It's not only the Jews, number one. <coughs> it is unsound historically because when the Israelites, as the Quran described, went after persecution in Egypt led by Moses, they did not enter land that was empty. 
they were the Canaanites living there. When Christianity came, some of these same Canaanites became Christians. When Islam came, some of the descendants of those Canaanites became Muslim. There was no invasion as such. In other words, they're not an, an implanted body. There are people who existed there and lived before Jews set foot in Palestine. And they happen to be now Muslims or Christians. So historically, it is not sound. Again, in terms of international law, you get a situation where terrorism, real terrorism, that was the initial introduction of terrorism in the Middle East. When Palestinians were terrorized and massacred, and there are numerous massacres, the famous Der Yassin, when Begin, the former prime minister of Israel, was a party to that, entering a village, a Muslim village, gathering at dawn time, very early morning. All men, women, and children, 248, as reported by a neutral observer from the Red Cross, and mowing them down. And this is only one example of that terror that was inflicted on them to drive them away from the land and declare a state in the land that doesn't belong to them. So on all uh, perspectives, a great deal of injustice has been done to the Palestinian people and the so-called peace process or peace agreement did not really provide the full rights or even close to reasonable rights to the Palestinians. It excluded those who were driven away in 1948, in 1956, in 1967. And these are the bulk of Palestinians. By what right would somebody who was born in Russia as a Jew all his life have greater claim in the land that belongs to a Palestinian who is driven away and now the peace process so-called does not allow him to return to the land of his ancestors or to recover his property? What kind of justice and what kind of international law? And why should international law be inter interpreted and applied in such unfair and partial way. Why should the response be to the occupation of Kuwait, which was wrong? That overwhelming power and the massacres goes on in Bosnia for three and a half years without moving until it became so obvious that something was done grudgingly at the end. This is the issue that Palestine is one issue. There is a European Palestine, Bosnia, similar with a great deal of similarity. There is a similar Palestine in India and the persecution that's taking place in Kashmir, in Chechnya, in other places. But it looks like Muslim blood doesn't have any value into it anywhere. Are you familiar with the, the speed of light mentioned in the Quran through the relation to the moon? I cannot honestly say that there is any direct verse in the Quran that I'm familiar with that speak particularly about the, uh, the speed of light. So, I would be cautious. And like I said, even when I talk about science, I try to stick to something that has been proven, which is so clear expression, like we'll be talking, inshallah, about embryology on Saturday. Okay, that one was covered, I think. Okay. Is the world moving towards the Quranic truth? I think that was answered early. I believe it is. And more and more discoveries will testify to this. <coughs> Could it be possible for human or other forms of life to exist on other planets. The Quran doesn't say it, the Quran doesn't negate it. For example, the verse cited earlier that Allah created many earths, but are these earths uh, user friendly? <laughs> are they inhabitable by humans? Do they have oxygen and water? We don't know, the Quran simply said there are planets like this. So this is a matter that is open. Uh, the a Muslim cannot, can take a rigid position that it is possible. It's a matter of discovery. What is hadith? Later on, it was important uh, language, but it is dead. Oh, Latin was an important language, but now it's dead. How about Arabic? No, Arabic is not dead. Arabic actually as a language uh, was revived and preserved by the Quran. In other words, the Arabic language being an international language now, or one of the international languages, owes its continuation and existence to the Quran. Because the Quran was not revealed as a scripture to be recited only by the priestly class, it was required to be memorized, understood, reflected upon, and implemented by people. It's not like today's people memorize the Quran without understanding. The Quran says about itself that you should reflect and understand it. So that gave a big booster to the Arabic language, and the Quran itself became the standard bearer to evaluate any uh, Arabic uh, work. So it's not dead, no, uh, fortunately. And that's good. Actually, in spite of the fact that there may be some words that are not as common today, 
you get people who know reasonable Arabic and you read the Quran and you can easily understand uh, its message after 1400 years. It's, you cannot even get a book written during Shakespeare's time and read it with the same ease that you read English. Even in English language, it has not preserved the Quran amazingly, in spite of changes of time, is still easy to follow. You got some questions. You gave us very informative uh, background of Muslims in the past, but what about us? Okay, that I think was answered also similar to the earlier question. We have to strive. We can't sit lazily, do nothing, and plan nothing, and say, no, if we are believers, God will give us power and give us uh, discoveries. No. The Prophet, peace be upon him, taught Muslims. He said, don't, don't sit down not, uh, and abstain from seeking provision and living. And you know that heaven doesn't rain gold or silver. Heaven doesn't rain gold or silver. Allah can provide, yes, but he wants us to do some work. That's the challenge, and that's fun, by the way. Uh, is listening to music <coughs> haram or unlawful in Islam? No. There are various opinions about music. It's, it's, it is untenable to say that any form of nice sound or music in itself is unlawful. The Prophet himself allowed some form of music using a drum, something like a drum, in... Um, in wedding and celebration. But there is difference of opinion amongst jurists or scholars about other types of music. Some tend to be more uh, strict on it than others. One of the most balanced views, because I don't have time to elaborate, is the one that's suggested in the book by um, <coughs> Dr. Yusuf Al-Qaradawi, available also in English under the title The Lawful and Forbidden uh, in Islam. He gives a balanced view and he also give the reason why there have been some differing interpretation of that. But this is a very brief one. I hope I'm not misunderstood. There are more details if there were time to give on the subject. Is there any evidence or hint in the Quran that there might be another living creature? Okay, that's the same or similar. How can young Muslim students, that's the last one I have, how can young Muslim students in this country keep themselves away from unlawful things, especially when they see it everywhere? like, you know, sex on TV and all of that. It is a challenge, and it is difficult. And that's why, as mentioned earlier, Islam as a complete way of living calls not only on the individual to be pious, but on society also to be clean. And that's why in Islam, uh, the uh, criminal punishments are not to be applied unless you remove the reasons for them in the first place. You don't punish for theft when there is hunger or injustice in society. You don't punish for these acts also unless you clean the society. Because otherwise, your purpose is totally uh, defeated. So for um, Muslim students living here, I can only remind them of one of the saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that among seven categories of people who will receive the mercy of God will be under his shadow and protection in the day of judgment, when there is no protection but God's protection, is shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah, a young person, man or woman, who grew up in obedience to God. Why he specified young? Because precisely of this, the attraction, allurement away from the way of God. Secondly, a person's remembrance of God, remembrance of judgment day, and the punishment and reward is another help. Thirdly, fasting. The Prophet recommended for young people to fast and keep away also from things that could stimulate the desire to do something that is wrong. And above all, my recommendation, not only to the youth, but to the parents. Please, 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 follow Sunnah. Follow the path of the Prophet. Don't follow the Muslim culture where you came from, which is contrary to this. Follow the culture of Islam, not of a particular country. And make it easy for the youth to get married. Don't put ethnic lines as a barrier or color lines. This is alien to Islamic thinking. Don't demand, as in many Muslim cultures, contrary to what the Prophet taught, demand exuberant, or exuberant marital gift. It is whatever they agree to. By uh, encouraging and facilitating marriage among Muslims, it would help protect one another. And my advice also to the young men, try to get married to a Muslim, even though you're allowed to marry people of the book. Because for Muslim women who are girls who are living in this country, 
Islamically, they can only marry a Muslim so that they can have their freedom of practice of their faith without intimidation. And it behooves Muslim youth to make sure that those you know, sisters also find Muslim husbands so that you can have a good Islamic family to raise your children and help each other in obedience to Allah. The last sign of the Day of Judgment <coughs> is when the sun will rise from the west and set in the east. Do you think this will uh, present the sun of Islam will come? I think this seems to be a more symbolical interpretation that I totally disagrees, disagree with. Because in the Quran, it's quite clear, um, I mean the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he speaks about the context of the sun coming from the west, he speaks in the context of the cosmic order transforming and taking totally different shape. For example, one of the interesting verses recited in the beginning of our meeting in Surah Al-Rahman, Surah 55, you heard the brother, Rabbul Mashriqayni wa Rabbul Maghribayn. God is the Lord of the two Easts and two Wests. That's interesting because elsewhere in the Quran, in some cases it says God is the Lord of East and West, which has a different meaning. That if you take East and West as the whole earth, earth the whole world, he's the Lord of both. But then in that particular verse it says the Lord of the two Easts and two Wests. Some people in the past interpret that to mean maybe the the east and west or sunrise and sunset in winter and summer but i've heard also of another possibility that some scientists say that the axis of the reverse uh, axis of the earth has reversed one time before in other words the north and verse versus south pole has transformed or taken different shape or uh, changed position this is again something that some theorize so it could possibly be that and the rising of the, the, uh, or the coming of the sun from the west could also be another reversal that might take place just before of the Day of Judgment in the, um, the, uh, the shape or the direction of movement of the earth. This is something that is still open for question. But then you find in the Quran also, Rabbul Mashariqi wal Maghrib, that God is the Lord of Easts and Wests in plural. And as you know, of course, the exact point from which the sun rises it's not only changing in winter and summer, but more delicately even, it's slightly different every day. So you can talk about various east or west, or taking the globe, at any point of time, there are many easts and west. There are several points of sunrise and sunset, depending on the perspective of those people on earth. There are lots of aspects like that that could be uh, examined. <coughs> what is the view of uh, recent study that homosexuality is genetic? as to say that someone is born homosexual. And doesn't that contradict with the Quran? Well, I must say in basic, as a basic principle, that God never, never considers something to be absolutely morally wrong and punishable and destroy people like Sodom and Gomorrah for if a person can't help it. Because the Quran clearly said, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا ما أتاه. Allah will not charge any soul beyond what he gave to that soul, its ability. And if indeed homosexuality was genetic, then there could have been no punishment in Islamic law for homosexuality. There could have been no Quranic and biblical narration about the severe de destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their deviation. Uh, and I must say two things. Number one, scientists are not in agreement. There is no proof scientifically that it is genetic. And secondly, I raise a question as to whether some of the scientists who are saying it is genetic are themselves homosexual. It's an embryology in the Quran. Jazakallah khair. Any more questions in the audience? Well, this will conclude our lecture tonight. Uh, I thank you all for coming.